Good afternoon and welcome to the IIEA. My name is Roisin Smith and I work on the Future of the Europe project here with the IIEA. And we are delighted to welcome you to this seminar on security cooperation in Northern Europe. This seminar has been hosted by the IIEA together with the ambassadors of Finland, Norway and Sweden and the Irish Defence Forces. We would like to welcome ambassadors, defence attaches and guests, but most especially our distinguished panellists. Um, I would like to welcome to my right uh, uh, Vice Admiral Mark Mellet, Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, Nicholas Grandholm, Deputy Director of Studies at the Swedish Defence Research Agency, Division for uh, Research Analysis, uh, to my left, Professor Colonel John Andreas Olsen, the Norwegian Defence Attaché to Ireland, and uh, Professor Lieutenant Colonel uh, Yuri Ratisalo, Excellent. the Military <laughs> Professor of War yeah. Studies at the Finnish uh, National Defence Universities. You're all very, very welcome today, and we're delighted to have you here. So just on a few procedural issues, this is a recording event, so if you haven't done so already, would you mind turning off or putting your mobile phone to silent, but please feel free to tweet at IIEA. Um, the second session after the question and answer se session will not be recorded, and it's under Chatham House rules uh, as well. And we also have... Um, the security cooperation in Europe is displayed at the back uh, of the room uh, that were generously brought to us, so please feel free to take um, a copy before leaving as well. So, to start, well, we know that Ireland has significantly contributed to international peace and security within the United Nations, the European Union, and NATO's Partnership for Peace. But we're also seeing that geographical changes in the security situation in the northern region has and is having considerable impact and implications for Ireland, Finland, Norway and Sweden. And I suppose given the particularly um, unpredictable nature and unsettling atmosphere of recent global events, it is quite apt and timely to be discussing these really serious issues and important pressing issues of our time on co cooperation and security. So I would li with that, I would like to invite our first speaker to give a presentation, no longer than 10 minutes, so there will be 40 minutes of speaking, and then we'll have a chance for people to air their views um, in the end. Okay? So, Professor Colonel John Andreas Olsen, uh, please, I'll give you this as well. And you're, okay. Okay? Oh. Admiral Mellet, ambassadors, distinguished guests, I very much appreciate this opportunity to talk about uh, our newest publication titled Security in Northern Europe. I would like to use my 10 minutes to present the purpose of the book, uh, a model for the way future, for the way ahead, and some challenges that we foresee. And the single most important message today is that we, small nations in Europe, are stronger together. This seminar focuses on Direction North, a region that has regained an urgency not seen for at least three decades. The book defines Northern Europe as the Northern Group countries, a UK-initiated constellation that includes the five Nordic countries, the three Baltic states, Poland, Germany, and the Netherlands. What we have in common is that Russia has re-emerged as a dominant factor for our defense planning. The revitalization of the bastion defense concept is something we must take seriously. This slide illustrates the Russian strategy in the high north and the North Atlantic. And as you can see on the map, Russia needs sea control of its inner bastion to defend its nuclear submarines outside the Kula Peninsula, maneuver freely in the Barents Sea, and protect its bases on land. And in terms of strategic depth, it needs sea denial down to the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. Russia also has the ability to disrupt our sea lines of communication and project power further south to prevent transatlantic reinforcement in a potential conflict. And if there is a conflict in Europe, we need reinforcement from the United States. Kremlin's military modernization program with emphasis on long range precision weapons represent a major distress for all of Europe. At the heart of the matter, Russia is introducing new class of conventional and nuclear attack submarines. Russia has developed an anti-axis capability that could hold Europe and North America at existential risk.
The question for today is how Northern Europe should respond to the new security challenge, individually and collectively. The authors of the book suggest a dual-track approach in which the Northern European countries strengthen cooperation among themselves and reinforce the transatlantic bond at the same time as they build a constructive relationship with Moscow. A strong and stable European uh, Northern Europe combines both national and regional efforts with a robust transatlantic relationship, and I cannot emphasize strongly enough how important it is to maintain and strengthen the transatlantic link between the United States and Europe, especially in times like these. <clears throat> NATO was designed for US leadership, and the United States is the backbone for a Europe whole, free, and at peace. So let me offer a model for the way forward. We have to start with a fundamental question. What kind of future relationship does Northern Europe want to have with Russia? What is our end state objective regarding Russia? And I believe, and the authors of the book believe, that we should have a strategic partnership with a peaceful and prosperous Russia. We do not want the Russian people to suffer. We do not want a desperate Kremlin. But our partnership must be on positive terms, founded on the three basic values of the North of the NATO Treaty from 1949, which is democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. This should be our long-term objective, which is then the basis for prudent strategy. And there is no holy grail, but we offer a return to basics and a strategy based on NATO in 3D, deterrence, defense, and dialogue. It is the Alliance's long-standing strategy, but it must be renewed and recalibrated to match the current situation. NATO must consider <coughs> deterrence in the context of today's political military realities, covering the full spectrum of nuclear, conventional, cyber, and hybrid dimensions. Defense includes updated contingency plans and a command and control, control structure that is fit for purpose, and an exercise and training regime that strengthens three key elements, namely interoperability, readiness, and resilience. Interoperability is not only about weapons and technology, the so-called plug and play, it is also about to know each other's doctrines, cultures, and mindsets, working together across borders, may I say the mental, the moral, and the physical interoperability. Resilience is about preparing the society at large, what Norway and Sweden refer to as the total defense concept, the cooperation between the defense forces and the civilian community. And readiness can be summarized in terms of the, the 430s, to have 30 air squadrons, 30 warships, and 30 mechanized battalions ready for action in 30 days. Interoperability, resilience, and readiness is the heart of deterrence and defense, but this book also emphasizes that NATO members must seek a constructive dialogue with Moscow through bilateral and multilateral engagements. We must find a common ground for coexistence, and dialogue starts with a series of confidence-building measures that emphasize two democratic principles, transparency and accountability. It all starts by accepting international law, and for small countries like Norway, international <coughs> law is our first line of defense. Then we can talk about the means, and the means to empower NATO in 3D is burden sharing, with emphasis on the three Cs, cash, capabilities, and contributions. European allies must increase their defense spending to the NATO target of 2% of their respective GDPs by 2024. And moreover, 20% of the defense budget must be invested in relevant high-end capabilities. And while the European allies must again focus on deterrence and collective defense, they must also contribute to fighting terrorism, handling migration, and human trafficking. Such efforts are part of NATO's larger burden-sharing scheme, what we all call the 360-degree approach. So the combination of the three Ps and the three Ds and the three Cs constitutes a theater-wide security and defense framework for Northern Europe, one that includes NATO's two key partners in the North, namely Sweden and Finland. And should a crisis occur in Northern Europe, there is every reason to believe that all Nordic countries mm -hmm. will engage in close cooperation with NATO. This ends ways means model is a positive take on the future. Some may say optimistic, some will say hopeful. I call it realistic. If there is a will, there is a way. 
let me conclude in uh, 60 seconds by identifying five main challenges for Northern Europe. First, we must find a way to make regional defence cooperation strategic rather than ad hoc. There is a lot of cooperation among our countries, but we must make them count. Second, we need to connect national strategies to NATO and US contingency plans with the emphasis on three key parameters that I mentioned earlier, interoperability, resilience, and readiness. And third, we must overcome the regional <coughs> Article 5 gap represented by Sweden and Finland. Cooperation with Sweden and Finland is great, but when all is said and done, they are not members of NATO. Fourth, we need to strengthen the all-important NATO-EU partnership. We need to find ways for these two organizations, for these two institutions to work hand in hand to cooperate rather than compete. And finally, we need to bridge Atlanticism with continentalism. These two outlooks on the world must be seen as mutually reinforcing given today's complex security environment. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the challenges as I see them. I offered a model for peace and prosperity. I believe it is the recipe for stronger together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, John, and especially thank you very much for keeping to the time allotted to exactly 10 minutes. Um, this one is set up next. So I get 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll Maybe 12, if you're lucky. I know. Your Excellencies, Admiral, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very much thank you for the possibility of, of addressing you all here on this very important topic about security cooperation, taking a perspective from, from Northern Europe. In my presentation, I have, I have two parts. I'm first going to talk about the security environment, where we are doing this security cooperation. Uh, and then on the other, in the other part of my presentation, I will look at a Finnish perspective on security and defense cooperation. Me coming from the military, being a military professor, I always uh, will take some kind of a defense focus in this security cooperation arrangement. I can offer you a Finnish perspective, not the Finnish perspective. So as an academic, I will only give my own personal <coughs> thoughts and analysis about what's going on in our security environment and how Finland is responding to that. I, I'm not trying to recite the, the official policy of Finland, just uh, trying to analyze it. Okay, so let's go to the first part, the security environment. I do think, do think that it's really important for us to understand today the logic about security in, in Europe, and even more broadly, it's really important to understand what has happened during the post-Cold War era. Because I think that what happened in the late 80s and early 90s, it has been a, a dramatic watershed in our thinking about what is security, what is defense in today's world. And based on our changing notions of security and defense, many states in Europe have, have redefined their take on, on, on security policy and defense policy and what kind of militaries they have. But this is the notion that we have uh, witnessed uh, in, in security sphere uh, quite a lot of the, the confrontation that vanished in the late 80s and 90s has been replaced by the notion that we live in this interdependent world where we are all states are facing similar kinds of new security threats. So we need to manage this globalizing world together uh, in a cooperative fashion, in a positive some way, in order to tackle the new security problems of our age. And I think this has been the kind of main focus for during the last 30 years, <laughs> and it has been dealing with quite a lot of so-called new threats, mostly non-military in nature, at least in Europe. So we have widened our perspective on security, international security, to, to include things like terrorism, climate change, drugs, uh, the spread of drugs, and so on and so on. So our kind of security sphere has, uh, has become uh, quite broad during the last 30 years. And I do think that the Mikkel Rasmussen, a, a Danish academic, said it pretty nicely 10 years ago, what was our security environment in 2006 when he noted that measured by the standards of the 20th century, meaning the Cold War era, we are safer than we have ever been. However, the standards by which we measure our security have changed. So not only are we to talk about what has been going on in our external environment, I think it's really important for us to understand also how have we redefined our take on security and defense during the last 30 years. Because I think our notions of security <coughs> and then the facts on the ground are two, two separate things, and we need to take both of these into account. So for me, looking at, looking at Europe or the West, so to speak, 
our notions of defense have also changed with this, uh, with this uh, changing notions of, of international security. So, so what defense has been for, for almost 30 years uh, after the Cold War ended, it was mostly defense-wise something that uh, military forces need to be used somewhere out there, out of area, in order to tackle the new problems, whether it's terrorism, humanitarian crisis, uh, and so on and so on. So many defense forces or military forces in Europe, in the West, have transformed their take. Uh, and many politicians have transformed the notion of, of where do we defend ourselves. We have, we have broadened the scope, and this has meant that we have had different kinds of uh, military forces, and we have constructed new kinds of military forces during the last 30 years in Europe. If we look at when the Cold War ended, for example, Germany had about 200 battalions. A battalion is a, is a military formation of approximately 1,000 soldiers. Today there are 30, and, and, the, and, the, and the same kind of logic has been going on in, in most European countries. So there has been a quite a lot of, of uh, losing the mass uh, for in, in the field of defense and, and de uh, developing deployable, small but uh, efficient troops uh, across Europe. And if you look at uh, a Gallup poll made in 2015, would you fight for your country? Uh, we can see uh, our, uh, that uh, in, in most European countries, people ha are not that uh, interested or have not been that willing uh, to put uh, their own efforts in, in the sphere of defense. Uh, ask whether you would fight for your country. I think the average, uh, average answer from Europe is something like 30 to 35 percent, yes. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, or if you can't see, I will tell you, uh, in, in Finland, uh, we have a little bit different take, and we always had had a, a different take, and we can t talk more about this in the discussion phase, but I think it's, it's 75 to 80 percent of the Finns say that I would fight for my country should the need arise. <laughs> but but in, in, in general level, in Europe, the notion that people uh, should be fighting for their country, that defense is for uh, uh, preparing against external uh, aggression, I think that quite a lot of that perspective was vanishing in Europe. Up, up until very recently. It was uh, 2013, in, in November, just when the Euromaidan crisis was getting heated up, when Carnegie Europe organized a high-level panel. There was the, the Danish four-star general, uh, the, the chairman of the military committee, and others discussing uh, about the future of NATO. And, and the key takeaway from that conference, and this was 2013, was, uh, as the summary says, NATO and its allies need to define a new narrative to convince citizens that defense still matters. And I think that this is really, really shows the kind of a new notions of defense and security that matured during the 25 years of the post-Cold War era. But of course, uh, after, after the Crimean annexation, uh, uh, things have started to look uh, quite a lot uh, into a different, uh, different, different kinds of uh, reality. But I don't think that, the, you know, the, the strained relations between Russia uh, and, and the West, uh, I think the, it's not only about Crimea, it's, it's more about uh, different paradigms in how do we conceptualize security. Here I have a quote from Vladimir Putin from 2012, and I think he, he nails it uh, when he says that uh, uh, NATO members, especially the United States, have developed a peculiar interpretation of security that is different from ours. And I think that that is what, we, what is going on. We are witnessing different frameworks for an, analyzing and understanding security in Russia and in many of the Western, Western countries, which means that when we are talking about international security, we are seeing different things. We have two perspectives and we can't communicate too well. And I, I think if we look at today's security problems, that this uh, difficulty in having communication uh, is, is really a big thing. So I, I do think this is the kind of the background about our changing notions of security and defense. And then a few words about, uh, I have still talking about 15 minutes to go, uh, on, on the Finnish case. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to note that uh, uh, about 30 years ago, we in Finland started the process of moving away from neutrality. And I think that was codified uh, uh, when we entered the European Union, as uh, so that we are non-aligned uh, non militarily, but we are not neutral anymore. Uh, so I think that the European Union framework is a really important security framework, although it is not a security arrangement as such. But many of the policies that the European Union does actually uh, help us uh, build a more secure uh, security environment for us. Of course, doing cooperation with NATO has been an important part, but only as a partner. 
not becoming a member. Uh, I will come back to this a little bit later on, very briefly. And then I think the really big third point has been that of diplomacy, having good relations, uh, keeping up good relations with, with as many actors as possible. I think that is a normal, normal thing to do for, for any state. But if you look at security cooperation, I think that, uh, uh, and especially, especially from, from a defense perspective, we have several really good uh, opportunities to develop better security outcomes in our region, in Northern Europe, by doing bilateral cooperation uh, with Sweden, uh, with, with doing a Nordic cooperation with Denmark and, and Norway, uh, as well with the NORDEFCO framework. Uh, 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 but if, if you look at this kind of a institutionalization of, of security cooperation agendas, I think what we have witnessed during the last couple of years is the, the, the multiplication of, of several new instruments that are, that are, in a way, expressions that Europeans are trying to figure out which formats, which tools would be best suitable or would be best uh, uh, to, uh, to further security interests. We have the Nordic Baltic 8, we have the Northern Group, we have the Joint Expeditionary Force, we have the Germany's Framework Nation concept. So we have um, quite a lot of new uh, attempts to, to make uh, Europe uh, more secure. Of course, all of those will not survive the next 10 years, and I don't think that they even have to survive, because I think that we are now in a political process of trying to figure out uh, uh, within the West and in Europe that which instrument would, would be the best. And, and those ones that will actually will work, I think that they will be strengthened, and some of those we might be losing in the next uh, few years. So then looking at uh, security cooperation from the defense perspective, uh, I have a graph here that tells you that uh, it looks like if we ask the Finnish population that we will not be joining NATO I I within the next few years. Here is an opinion poll during the last 15 years where the blue bar means how many people say that we should be joining. That is between 20 and 30 percent has been, has been the same for the last 20 years uh, at least. And then there is the green bar which is something like 60, 65 percent of the Finnish population that say that we shouldn't be joining. So we, I think that the, the, the kind of general message, uh, what people are thinking is that NATO is doing a good job, we need to cooperate with NATO, but, but I don't, uh, at, at, this, at this stage it would, be, it would not be helpful for joining. So I, I would say that uh, uh, I agree we need to cooperate more, but, but the, the kind of the official membership aspect might be long in the future, if at all. And, and I would say that if I have to look at it from a Finnish perspective, a Finnish perspective, I think that the, <coughs> the trend is that we are interested in doing more defense and security cooperation within Europe, even maybe even on a broader agenda. But I think that is based on the notion that we need to have a core defense capability as a foundation for, for being able to cooperate. So I think that uh, it's, it's credible national capabilities that actually facilitate cooperation, uh, and that is the baseline. So I would like to end with a picture of a porcupine. I think that uh, I think that our security cooperation is based on the notion that, if needed, we can be stingy enough uh, or stingy enough. Uh, it's even the biggest bear doesn't want to eat a porcupine. But then we are really interested in developing those tools that others with others in order to, to further uh, security in Northern Europe. Thank you. Very much, and, and for your military position on the timing as well. Thank you. Um, could I invite Vice Admiral uh, Mark Mallet, uh, Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, to speak to us on the Irish perspective? Then, thank you. It's just a, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I, I speak um, in a personal capacity um, with a slight, I suppose, interest from in my academic background. Um, the main theme I want to I suppose uh, highlight today is the, the theme of collaboration. On the table here, our countries are different, but our values are very similar. Mm. Our militaries are different, but our purpose is similar. We're all part of the bedrock that underpins our sovereignty, and we're part of the institutions that provide for the framework of the civil society in our own countries, where people are free, where the institutions of state function, and where the vulnerable are protected. But we all know that freedom is not free, and sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imaginary than real. So on a day-to-day -day basis, the challenge our own defence forces face is to facilitate a safe and secure environment in Ireland, and that's what our air crews do in, in terms of patrolling our airspace, our soldiers do in terms of land space, and our sailors in terms of the maritime space. Ireland has a jurisdiction that's almost three times the size of Germany, almost a million square kilometres, 
trillions of euros have yet to be found hydrocarbon and mineral, mineral, resor mineral resources. One of the richest food producing ecosystems and renewable energy environments on the planet. 90% of the air travel between uh, Europe and North America passes through airspace under Irish control. And our policy framework in terms of our defence is set out in the 2015 White Paper on Defence. And uh, that is built on military neutrality, but not on isolationism. In fact, for decades, our country has been a, a proponent of multilateralism, in particular under the institutions of the United Nations. And we're doing a good job. Uh, Ireland is in the top 5% of most secure countries in the world, according to the Global Peace Index. It's an attractor for foreign direct investment. It's the digital capital of Europe, with huge uh, multinational investments, uh, as well as bio, made, and pharma tech uh, centred here in Ireland. But a safe and secure environment at home doesn't mean a safe and secure environment everywhere. And for over 60 years, Ireland has contributed to multinational operations under the aegis of the United Nations. We've operated in some of the most challenging security environments in the world, with almost 70,000 individual tours of duty, and 87 members of our defence forces have made the ultimate sacrifice in the cause of peace. Right now, our main missions are in Lebanon, in Syria, in the Balkans, and in Mali, and over 650 troops in 14 missions in 14 countries. We've intervened with lawless gangs, <coughs> stood up to violent extremists, we've freed hostages, and in recent years we've rescued almost 18,000 people in the Mediterranean. We've seen hundreds of people drown, and we've recovered, we've recovered scores of bodies. And we're in a position now whereby, while we're security producers, there's a huge demand because of security consumers. And I think when we look at it, Europe was born out of the ashes of the Second World War, and yet few people seem to remember that, not to mention the First World War. I think the memories of the Balkan Wars are still raw in the memory of many Europeans. And right now on our borders, we have two wars, a full-scale hybrid war in Ukraine, where over 10,000 people have died, and in <coughs> Syria, the remnants of the multiple proxy wars that have gone for, on for the past number of years, with almost a half a million people dead and almost 11 million people displaced. The remnants of ISIS that still stay in Iraq and Syria have moved on towards uh, Libya, and they're linking up across the Maghreb with the likes of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and other terrorist groups across the Sahel, adding to instability in northern Africa. We have troops in Mali, which is a very challenging uh, security environment, and drug cartels are shipping through Western Africa up into Europe, where often these shipments are intertwining with people and weapons trafficking. And these challenges are also exacerbated by other major challenges, such as the impact of climate change and population increase. <coughs> In fact, Africa is cited as one of the continents most impacted by climate change. And when you look at the health and the wealth and the security of Europe, and the lack of health and the lack of wealth and the lack of security in other places, Migration will continue into the future. And often this migrate, migration is leveraged by criminal networks who are perverse in terms of the, the desperate situation that these people are in. And our times are sometimes shaped by social media, which is polarizing political cohesion, given a rise to the right, which is a challenge of the future. Growing evidence of violent extremism. There is also growing evidence of espionage and state-sponsored cyber interfering with the institutions of democracy and civil society. And of course, we have the worry and the challenges of attacks on critical national in infrastructure, which could have catastrophic outcomes. We live at a time of unpredictability, the likes of which we have never seen before. And this is the fourth, if not the fifth, successive year of a global deterioration in peace and security. There is growing complexity which is leading to vulnerability for the institutions of civil society. And many are hankering for the simplicity that seems to go with unilateralism, often driving populism, wanting to forego the burden of values and norms and principles. Power is shifting, if not inverting, with a mix of tech, cloud, mobile data, internet of things, artificial intelligence, often challenging the legitimacy of government and institutions. And there are tensions between for leadership and management in terms of tra traditional settled organisation and the need for a new, disruptive, innovative approach. So there is positive growth, however, in terms of robotics and data. And for me, I often say that three things are clear. If we don't leverage the information and knowledge that's available to us, we increase risk. If our competitor or enemy leverages data and information available to them, they become more formidable. 
And the simple reality is that every moment of every day, new technologies and new ways of doing things are being created. 400 years ago, John Donne said, no man is an island entire to himself. Every one is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. And this account from John Donne is prophetic. It means we're increasingly dependent, interdependent, and in our own organization, our own defense force and our defense organization, we're increasingly looking at four principles built around firstly on the issue of values. Values are about the norms and principles that define a human behavior. At a state level, and I was talking to Jill earlier on, they're about the sustainable development goals and a framework for collaboration internationally. At a national level, they're also about adaptation of the Women, Peace and Security 1325 agenda, and also for our own organization, the, 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 the mortar that joins the BRICS of our various uh, institutions. The second principle is about collaboration. Our white paper in defense makes a key point that increasingly the answers to our challenging problems lie outside our organizational boundary. So we need to actually network externally and collaborate together. We need to move away from silos. Silos undermine trust, efficiency, and effectiveness, and try and leverage diverse networks that bring us together. And we need to actually look at moving from closed mindsets to open mindsets. And in this regard, we're moving ourselves with institutions such as PESCO, and more recently, the adaptation of the EU and NATO SOFAs. The third principle is about diversity. In our external environment, enhancing our external partnerships is critical. It's also about driving internally in terms of the way we work with regards to academia and other institutions such as entrepreneurs and, and business. Internally, a huge amount of our focus has been on the whole development of a diversity and in inclusion strategy. And key to that, actually, in our own defence forces is a recognition that we need to move and increase the number of women in our defence forces recognition that is there in terms of women, peace and security, and also one of the sustainable development goals that highlights the importance of women and children in the context of moving forward. And the final principle is actually the need for greater autonomy in organisations. We're in an information age whereby increasingly we need to have mission command, devolve decision making to the lowest possible level in our organisations. In a world of breakneck speed, opportunities come to pass, not to pause. But in increasing autonomy in terms of decision-making, we must also increase the tolerance for risk. It's inevitable in complex organisations mistakes will happen. But mistakes should be seen for the learning opportunity that it gives. I think it's best off in terms of Amazon said, success and failure are inseparable twin twins. And we need greater dissent in terms of people standing up rather than echo chambers. I think a study was done recently where it said 85% of organisations have numbers who would say something needs to be done, but they never put their hand up and actually call for that change. Pulling this all together for us, the key is leadership. Leadership that is sustained, leadership that's about character and about um, competence. It facilitates autonomy. It facilitates the values and norms that will make things better. It's also about ensuring that leadership at the right level. I think it was uh, Mary Parker Follett said, leadership is not so much about the exercise of power, but about that capacity to create that sense of power in those who are led. The real role of a leader is to create more leaders. So we live in a time where there's a rate of change as if we are at war, and yet we are at peace. We have black swans in terms of unknown unknowns, items that we can't predict, violent extremism, hybrid, extreme right, state-sponsored cyber. Indeed, we have black elephants, known unknowns, that we don't know what to do with. And I often say recently that uh, we have black rabbits, where wicked problems amplify and multiply each other, driving further uncertainty and chaos. We see disparate phenomena, climate change, population increase, cyber and violent extremism. We need to be prepared to think the unthinkable and think the unpalatable. We need to collaborate within the policy frameworks that we have. Thank you. Hopefully for the third time, I'll invite uh, Deputy Director Nicholas Grantome to speak to us. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Excellencies, Admirals, Admiral, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for that kind introduction as well. 
Um, this will be an attempt at a brief overview, and by no means will it cover all the whole range of factors changing in the Nordic region and relations to NATO here, and I hope we can bring up much of the specifics in the Q&A session later. The perspective I bring is from Stockholm, which is, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone, uh, and also coming from a Swedish government agency, uh, the FOI, uh, I speak here today in a personal capacity, so the views expressed here are not necessarily in line with those of the government of Sweden. Um, what I'd like to cover here is uh, three main themes. To first, a brief overview of the different threat factors facing the Nordics today, and second, some recent initiatives in Nordic defense cooperation, how they rela their relations to NATO are, develop are developing and their defense spending. Thirdly, what concrete measures could be undertaken to increase defense capability in the Nordic region and the high north in addition to the ones already under development? So first of all, the geopolitical uh, um, uh, climate has uh, taken a turn for the worse in, the past, in recent years. There is a, it's an ongoing, rapid and large-scale redistribution of resources for power and influence that changes the conditions, affects interstate relations and multilateral organizations in the international system, making the post-1945 and post-1990 solutions look distinctly shaky. The Nordic region and what used to be known as the High North, including the North Atlantic, is increasingly seen as one connected region in terms of security. The realization uh, among the Nordics that Russia has developed a broader concept of operations ranging from influence operations over so-called gray zone operations to open conflict means uh, a trend towards a defensive stance to counter this threat is clearly visible among the Nordics. Concerns over the transatlantic relations are rising among the Nordics. What effect will the policies of the current U.S. administration have on security in the Nordic region? Simultaneously, deployments <coughs> and activities of the U.S. armed forces, along, along with European allies in Northern Europe, have increased in recent years. So on one level, increased military and naval deployments and activities, and on the top political level, expressed doubts about the usefulness of U.S. UP European cooperation on security. This triggers distrust in Europe and unease among the Nordics. Added to that are the challenges of EU cooperation, where Brexit, the activities of so-called illiberal democracies in Eastern and Central Europe, and populist protest and revolt elsewhere in Europe, further complicate things for the Nordics. As a part of this rather bleak outlook, I'd also like to add the role of China. And here the Nordics are not alone in being courted uh, by her. Com commercial ventures backed up indirectly or directly by the uh, People's Liberation Army or directly by the Chinese state aims uh, at gaining influence or taking control of uh, telecommunications facilities, infrastructure, ground-based space assets and sensitive high-tech companies. Political communication from the Chinese government has also at times taken on a high note. The so-called Belt and Road Initiative and its Nordic and Arctic components is a case in point. So for the Nordic nations, these strategic factors taken together add, add up to something akin to a perfect storm. Several simultaneous and different threat factors ha thus have to be taken into account. The strategic landscape is changing rapidly, and this will affect all the Nordics. The Nordics, however, are similar in several ways, but their perspectives sometimes differ due to geography and historical experience. We're all liberal democracies with a high degree of participation in the democratic processes. The respective national strategies for security have also led to different choices in arranging our security affairs. <coughs> All the Nordics are now in the process of transiting the defense emphasis uh, uh, in order to enhance territorial defense and away from a focus on the international crisis management operations. This means more units, more of intergovernmental cooperation, increased military expen expenditure, including more domains such as cyber and the countering of influence operations. So how have the Nordics tried to uh, face these challenges of security and safety facing them today? 
I look at this from two angles, Nordic defense cooperation and defense spending. The world security has for a long time been a feature of cooperation between the Nordics. In my opinion, this will gradually take on a higher quality, but some limits will remain due to the different choices made in security arrangements. One of sev several vehicles in deepening and broadening the cooperation is the Intergovernmental Nordic Defense Cooperation, NORDEFCO, formed in 2009. This recently seems to have been re-energized. In mid-November 2018, a new set of political guidelines were adopted at the Nordic Defense Ministers' meeting in Oslo. And the key paragraph uh, from the vision <coughs> document takes into account the different security affiliations and still aims for a joint perspective on security. In the document, 16 operationalized targets for cooperation are to be implemented by 2025. These range from movement and storage of military units and equipment between and through the nations in support of national and multinational activities, operations and deployments, over to strategic dialogue and common situational awareness in peace, crisis and conflict in all relevant domains. Cyber warfare and information operations also form part of the areas of cooperation. Besides much else, it also includes strengthened dialogue with the Baltic states and enhanced armaments and co coordination and cooperation. It remains to be seen whether this rather ambitious agenda for Nordefco will come to fruition this time around. Previous initiatives of this sort have founded on strategic myopia and ingrained habits. So is it any different this time? On balance, I think so. The realization that the strategic climate has taken a serious turn for the worse, and this probably will be for the foreseeable future, will drive the Nordics closer together in defense and security. There are also additional intra-Nordic defense and security uh, efforts ongoing. In particular, the Swedish-Finnish project started a few years ago, where a joint naval task group is under development as well as aiming for a partial integration of the Swedish and Finnish air forces. To this one, one can add the Swedish-Finnish-Norwegian Air Force Corporation in the north, the cross-border training arrangement. These projects are aimed at enabling operational cooperation in peace, crisis, and, conf and in conflict. The Swedish-Finnish cooperation has also been supplemented by a trilateral arrangement with the United States. Somewhat paradoxically, as great strides are taken in the Swedish-Finnish cooperation, Swedish-Norwegian cooperation has until recent, recently been beset with problems. Several attempts at joint de de development and acquisition of artillery system, joint uh, purchase of trucks and selling of Swedish submarines and fighter planes to Norway have failed and caused friction. A new start was clearly needed, and this is now well underway. Part of the reason for this renewed effort is that strategically, Norway and Sweden can be seen as a pair of Siamese twins. The problem is that we are joined back to back, and that makes com communication sometimes rather difficult. <laughs> but nevertheless, strategic cooperation is needed. Relations between uh, NATO and the Nordics, members and partners, are also influenced by the worsening security situation. It has so far been met with deployments, changes in exercise patterns uh, uh, and content, uh, as well as an increase in day-to-day -day operational uh, cross-border cooperation. The Enhanced Opportunities Partnership, the EOP for short, opens up for standardization exercises and research cooperation within NATO structures for the six EUP partners, Sweden and Finland among them. And this is done in order to further improve defense capabilities in several ways. So I'd like to turn for a few minutes here to defense spending among the Nordics here. The discussion on this topic is, in my view, often somewhat superficial. Only too often does it not get past a simple comparative discussion on defense spending as a percentage of GDP. At FOI, we have for many years had a defense economics analysis program, study program, where all countries were analyzed. And one conclusion from when looking at the data for the Nordics uh, is uh, on this somewhat cluttered slide, is that all the Nordics seem to have realized that the days of ever lower defense spending is in the, lies in the past. 
Increases in military expenditure can be seen <coughs> clearly seen in all countries, but these are colored by national processes and decision-making cultures. But is the change going quickly enough to catch up and provide the Nordics with a better stabilizing threshold capability for the region in uh, capability in, in conflict, in open conflict? I think not. So what more concrete things could be done to achieve a higher operational effect with existing resources for defense? My point of departure here is that I see the Nordic Baltic region with its surrounding seas as a cohesive strategic region in terms of defense and security. First, the existing uh, cooperation between the Swedish, Norwegian and Finnish air forces, the cross-border training arrangement I mentioned earlier. Uh, could be scaled up to form a fully-fledged Nordic strike force. Its focus should not be limited to the north. With the mandate for operations all over the Nordic Baltic region, it would form a respectable <coughs> strike component that any aggressor would have to take into account and help fill a gap in current capabilities. The arrangement should be open to other nations as well. Second, in the area of space technology, there is now a fast-paced development meaning that lead times for development and launch are significantly shorter and costs are one or two magnitudes lower. The situational awareness needs to improve uh, in the Nordic region. A joint Nordic satellite system could be a help in this respect. Third, analytical work on security and defense for the Nordic Baltic region should be enhanced. This is to an, ex an extent already on the way, but a number of issues would benefit from better common understanding based on proper analysis of the wider regional strategic picture, thereby contributing to better decision making and minimizing wishful thinking. Lastly, the Russian attempts um, mentioned uh, earlier at developing a bastion in the north means that air and naval power projections south into the North Atlantic will be possible. Threats to trans transatlantic sea lines of communication and underwater communications could develop into serious threat in the Nordic to the Bal Nordic Baltic region. An intensified Nordic naval and maritime operational cooperation and development for the North Sea, Skagerrak and Kattegat in order to protect the sea lines into the Baltic Sea comes to mind. So, uh, to summarize, uh, several threat factors or simultaneously facing the Nordics, forming something of a perfect storm. Current solutions to security may not work that well in the future. The trend is clearly towards increased scope, quantity and quality in Nordic defense cooperation. A lot has been done, in particular since 2014, and more things are in the works. But the pace of change is currently not fast enough. The relative gap in capabilities to other powers in the region is widening. So is a higher gear in defense efforts among the Nordics around the corner? What speaks in favor of this is the realization that the threats are bigger, more varying than expected, and more long term. Several initiatives <coughs> in the past few years show that the Nordics in different ways have realized this and are adjusting their defense and security policies. What speaks against this trend is the reluctance to spend more on defense and budgetary competition with other important sectors. But on balance, yes, I think it seems likely. So, to, 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 um, uh, to end up here, the Nordics are in various degrees consensus-oriented societies, and this means that it takes a lot to change established defense concepts and spending levels. We're in some ways behind the curve, but the frames of reference are now being adjusted. I just hope that it's all fast enough. So, thank you very much. Thank you.